This is the third gen tundra, and this is the second gen tundra. Articulation or suspension flex is critical for off road, but most manufacturers don't publish any numbers. So to measure it ourselves, I use a corner travel index or CTI style setup, which simulates a cross axle situation. For my measurement, the new Tundra front suspension flexed 4 inches and the rear had 10.6, a total of 14.6 inches of articulation. So is 14.6 good? To put it into some context, this is a bone stock FJ Cruiser and it measured 14.5. But the FJ has a 5 inch narrower track width than the Tundra. With much wider control arms and rear axle, I was hoping the Tundra would flex more, but the result was a little disappointing. Alright, what about the second gen Tundra? How far up can it go? What? Well, looks like I ran out of ramps before it ran out of flex. At the top, I measured 6.3 inches of front end articulation and 14.8 from the rear. But keep in mind, it did not break traction. So the real limits are even higher. I want to acknowledge that this is the third vehicle I witnessed maxing out these ramps. The other two were my long travel FJ and a Jeep JL Extreme Recon. But wait a minute, if all three vehicles make it to the top, why on earth does the Tundra measure 3 inches less? Shouldn't they all be the same? Aha, this is the fascinating part. This number measures the tire to fender distance before versus after. So this articulation is solely from the suspension. But if we measure how high the tire was raised from the ground, we will always get a larger number. Because this number also includes the tire flex and more importantly, twisting of the frame. In my testing, all tires were in street pressure. So for the sake of simplicity, let's assume the tire flex was negligible. Each ramp is 12 and 3 quarter inches tall. So if we made it to the top, the total effective articulation should be 25.5 inches. For my FJ and the Jeep, 24 inches came from the suspension, and the remaining 1.5 came from the frame. The second gen Tundra on the other hand, had 4.4 inches worth of frame twist. In other words, 20% of its total flex was the frame. Uh, weird flex, but okay. The flexible C-channel frame has been a hot debate among Tundra owners. One of the benefits Toyota claimed was exactly this, off-road articulation. Back here, and again, it's for making sure that the vehicle has the amount of frame flex in it that's necessary to, to meet our off-road needs. And we just verified it firsthand. The new Tundra, on the other hand, now has a fully boxed frame. By the same measurement, it only has 2.1 inches of frame flex, significantly less than the old truck. However, frame flex isn't always desired. We will review more aspects about the frame in my next video, so subscribe and stay tuned for that. But frame flex aside, the new suspension itself still performed worse. You may think it was because this second gen has aftermarket suspension, but no. The only aftermarket parts were the front coilovers and the rear shocks, and they have the same length as the second gen TRD Pro. So as far as articulation concerned, we were comparing Pro to Pro. Alright, I think it's time for me to put on my engineer's hat and dive deeper into the suspension design. The main theme Toyota heavily emphasized on the new truck is improving ride quality and handling. But were these goals achieved by sacrificing off-road capability? To find out, we need to first understand how the old and new suspension works. The rear suspension received a fundamental revamp, changing from leaf springs 
to multi-link with coil springs. And the essence of this change is less about the spring, but more about the links. To illustrate this, we remove both lead springs on the second gen. The rear axle become completely loose from the vehicle. I can move it however I want. On the other hand, if I remove both coil springs, the rear axle is still fully constrained by five control arms, or links. The five links include two lower links, two upper links, and one track bar, or panhard rod. The only possible motion is up and down. For example, if the axle want to shift side to side, which is undesired, it will have to literally compress or stretch the steel panhard rod along its length, which is not possible. In contrast, it is a lot easier to deflect the lead string sideways a bit, just enough to make a looser handling. To reduce these unwanted movements, we need to increase the lateral stiffness of the lead springs. But to achieve that, we would inevitably increase the stiffness up and down as well. So most of the time, we have to compromise both ends and land somewhere in between. A somewhat stiff ride with a somewhat loose handling. On the new suspension, all coil springs do is to carry vertical load. So we can tune it for a much better ride. We now decoupled ride quality from handling and can truly have the best of both worlds. And you might have also heard about the saying that coil springs also flex better than lead springs. But that was not what we observed. Why is that? One big difference is the third gen now comes with the rear stabilizer bar but the second gen didn't have one from the factory. The stabilizer bar, or anti-sway bar, improves handling, but adds resistance to articulation. However, from my measurement, the new rear sway bar was not the limiting factor. Both trucks reached the bump stop and fully extended the shock. The shocks were actually the real limiting factor. Comparing the TRD off-row shocks, old versus new, they were very similar. However, the third gen bottom shock mounts now hangs one and a quarter inch lower. So even with the same shock, the third gen lost one and a quarter inch in droop. And things got more interesting for TRD Pro. The second gen Pro receives longer shocks than the TRD off-road. It adds one and a half inch extra droop, but when I measured the 3rd gen TRD Pro, its rear shock has identical length as this one from TRD off-road. So all this add up to a pretty big difference in rear articulation. The puzzling part is, why didn't Toyota simply make the new shocks longer? It wouldn't hurt ride quality and handling. I suspect the official answer may be, it is not needed for ride and handling, and those who really want can go aftermarket. So Toyota didn't include longer shocks from the factory. It'd be a lot cooler if you did. <laughs> now, let's transition to the front suspension. Both old and new Tundra use a very similar high mount double wishbone layout. But why did the old design had over 50% more articulation? For an independent suspension, the longer the control arms, the more travel possible at the wheel. But both 2nd and 3rd gen has the same upper and lower arm length. By measuring the gap under the bump stop, I estimate both Tundras has almost 10 inches of wheel travel in the front. However, this 10 inches is straight up and down travel for like when you go fast over bumps. But for slow speed articulation, one wheel up and the other one down, neither truck utilize 100% of that wheel travel. Unlike the solid rear axles, neither IFS reached the bump stop, nor fully extended the shock. We were limited by the front sway bars. And this is where things got interesting. On the second gen, the sway bar end links connect to the middle of the lower control arm. But on the third gen, the sway bar and the coilover swap position. This changes the motion ratio. 
To illustrate the idea of motion ratio, the most obvious example is to compare the coilovers. The new shock is significantly shorter because it is mounted more inboard. So for the same amount of wheel travel, we need less shock travel. Meanwhile, for the same amount of wheel force, we need more force from the coilover. That's why the new Tundra has noticeably beefier front springs. By the same principles, because the new sway bar is mounted further outwards, to achieve the same effect, we should have a skinnier bar. But we have a thicker one. Therefore, a stiffer bar plus a more efficient motion ratio resulted in significantly less articulation. On the flip side, I can attest this third gen has significantly less body roll, and it was a blast to drive on road. Remember, the main theme of this truck was ride quality and handling. But inevitably, this sway bar change sacrificed some off-road capability. And you know what's even more interesting? This red sway bar is unique to the third gen TRD Pro. The new SR5 has a different black sway bar. They share the same diameter, except the black bar is hollow inside and the red one is solid. So the top off-road trim, TRD Pro, has the stiffest front sway bar, thus the least amount of articulation. Does that even make sense? We'll come back to this in a bit. On the bright side, not all changes sacrifice off-road capability. The steering knuckle changed from forged steel to forged aluminum. I know some of you would say aluminum is weaker than steel. That's true for the material. But the new knuckle has significantly beefier geometry, so the end product is actually stronger. On second gen, it wasn't uncommon to bend the skinny steel knuckle. So well done spindle gusset was a thing. And now, that is a thing of the past. But the most fascinating part is, despite being so much thicker, the new knuckle actually weighs 7 pounds less. That is 39% lighter. The steering knuckles are unsprung mass, so this will noticeably improve ride quality, both on and off-road. The new upper control arm is now fully boxed, which is far more rigid than the old one. Along with the stiffer aluminum knuckle, they significantly tightens up the handling. Again, both on and off-road. By the way, if these side-by-side -side part comparison were helpful, we need to thank my friend Nick and Greg at Koch33 Toyota. They lend me thousands of dollars worth of new parts for these videos. Koch33 is a Toyota dealership who actually love and understand off-road. Not only do they sell Toyota trucks, they also install all kinds of mods. So check them out if you're in the market, and tell them the Tinker sent you. I will leave their links in the description below. Now, let's come back to articulation. In my recent poll on YouTube, 66% of you actually predicted the second gen has more flex. But I bet most of you didn't expect such a big difference. Yet again, let's be honest, how many Tundras actually use full suspension flex and do serious wheeling? The sheer size of the Tundra simply doesn't fit on most technical trails. Hold on, hold on, hold on, stop. <laughs> Just clearing your control arms. I know, I know, some of you do hardcore wheel your Tundras, like my friend Josh on 37s. Josh is a total badass. To further improve articulation, he straight up removed his front sway bar. His second gen was a total beast over rocks, but you can just imagine how it drives on road. Josh is cool, and I love wheeling with him, but most Tundra owners are not Josh. Instead, they are more like my friend James. James isn't interested in climbing the biggest rock. Instead, he seeks joy traveling the country with his family and a ton of gear. James is an overlander, and he cares a lot about ride quality and handling. 
So James did the polar opposite from Josh. He actually added more sway bar. These are the TRD sway bars from in rear, and both of them are solid inside. Oh, wait a minute. These are just like the solid sway bar on the third gen TRD Pro. Except on the second gen, these were originally designed for the TRD Sport, which was a street focus package. However, these TRD Sport sway bars were very popular among all second gen owners. Yes, these second gens could have had more flex, but they chose to give that up for better handling. Of course, Toyota took notice. So instead of pleasing the rare hardcore enthusiasts like Josh, they doubled down to improve ride quality and handling for James. The TRD Sport sway bar now made its way to the TRD Pro. And this makes more sense for the mass market. If you enjoyed this suspension review, you will definitely love the next video. We will go over even more mechanical changes on the new Tundra. Subscribe so you don't miss that one coming. I would also like to thank all the Tundra enthusiasts that made this video possible. This impressive second gen belongs to my friend Kong at 4 Wheel Drive is Life channel. Subscribe to him for more great off-road content. My friend Josh and James helped me film a tons of off-road footage and ensure this press vehicle is damage free. Hold on, hold on, hold on, stop. <laughs> I will also leave their social link in the description below. Thank you for watching. I will see you in the next one.